What I'm going to do today is actually to uh, share with you the thought process that will be involved in terms of treating posterior teeth. Because when it comes to posterior teeth, a lot of time we are actually focusing more on the um, load distribution, not so much on the uh, aesthetic aspect of things, which is under uh, discussed in most of this uh, situation. So when we need to look at replacement of teeth, the first thing that comes to mind is good clinical um, judgment, which is first the clinical diagnosis, as well as the um, treatment planning of uh, teeth in the posterior zone becomes the key indicator of clinical success. So once we have determined that there's a need to replace posterior teeth using dental implants, then it leaves us to start deciding what is the treatment planning for when we consider posterior implant replacement. First, treatment goal as it comes to implant planning, it depends on how we decide how many teeth are we going to replace. And then subsequently, we should then look at the treatment options. When we look at treatment options, what I learned over the years is we need to look into um, several aspects. First, when we look at the treatment options, we have to decide on how many implants are we going to place in that space. Are we going to put two implants with three unit bridge? Are we going to have three implants with three teeth? Or should these three teeth be actually splintered together? Can we actually have cantilever design? And all those things actually come in the second portion, which is the treatment decision in options. And finally, of course, we have to start discussing as to what kind of designs are we going to have. Today, we have all this CAT CAM technology. We can design fantastic uh, results. We have good material selections. But the critical part of it is how are we going to design the apartments? And finally, the final prosthesis. Should it be screw retained, cement retained, and when are we going to do that? And the final discussion, because some of this treatment can be costly, we have to involve the patient, the clinician, as well as the technician in this uh, discussion. Now, as with any restorative treatment, we all know that there's a selection in terms of implants. This morning, we heard a lot of experts talking about it. But from a prosthetic standpoint, I felt that in the posterior area, because we are limited by the sinus, we are limited by the inferior alveolar nerve, a lot of time, we are actually dealing with height limitation. In the anterior area, because most of the time the roots are longer, thin buckle plates. So after tooth extraction, what we are dealing with a lot of time is the width limitation. And slowly, we start discussing with our surgeon, we realize that in terms of implant selection, we are actually moving more and more towards shorter and wider implant for the posterior. And in the anterior, we are moving towards narrower and slightly longer implants so that we can engage the base of the bone. So these limitations then leads into what I'm going to discuss today. We are going to discuss, one, the size of implants in terms of prosthetic implant treatment, meaning the length and the diameter. Second, I want to discuss a little bit about distribution of implants in terms of the number of implants involved, as well as how, where is the position are we going to do. And finally, the design of restorations. Should it be screw, cement retained, the abutment's design, as well as the uh, crown material selection. Here I define short implants. Short implants is, the way we look at it is any implants that is under 10 millimeters, and very often we are using it in reduced bone height, as well as some anatomical structures. Now, the question always posed to us, as we talk to our students, is they always ask, by the use of short implants, will it actually compromise the clinical outcome? That's number one. And also, by using short implants, are we actually looking at things having more complication long-term in the future? 
I'm not going to discuss a little bit of those, uh, you know, the surgical part of the short implants, but I'm going to say about in terms of occlusal forces. Because in the posterior area where we want to use short implants, a lot of time we are looking at force distribution. So when we talk about an implant that is already loaded, actually the majority of the shear force is distribu distributed at the level of the first few threads, which means that once the in minimum implant length is osteointegrated, the implant diameter now becomes important. Yeah, we keep talking about the length, which is important, because after integration, the first few threads is the one that is going to spread the load. But from a prosthetic standpoint, the width is also important, which I will share with you later. Occlusal forces and short implants, cervical parts play a more critical role in terms of load distribution, which I'm going to discuss a little bit more. So once we ascertain that those bone areas, based on your surgeon, they may decide on short implants or grafted the sinus or things like that, we can accept short implants for posterior area, but at the same time, we want it to have to increase the prosthetic base because it has allowed us to have better distribution of occlusal forces and thereby allow better stability to our screw, to our abutments without fracturing some of these uh, areas. So using this example, when we look at an empty space in any treatment, this is a failed three-unit uh, bridge. Posteriorly, there's some uh, PA lesions on that tooth. In the middle, we have an area with uh, reduced uh, bone height. We then have to decide whether we want to do sinus grafting or we should consider a little bit of uh, short implants uh, usage. Or should we actually, for the premolars, look at immediate approach or delay approach? This will face a lot of restorative dentists day in, day out. So, as we start planning, we have to be more comprehensive. So, for the posterior, we thought saving the tooth is useful. We do a root canal followed by a crown. In the middle area, because the tendency of some of our patients is to avoid sinus grafting, they are quite reluctant to do it. Now, we have an option to use short implants. We are going to use shorter implants. And finally, in the anterior premolar area, because we have adequate buckle plate, we have the apical area, we have adequate bone, we use an immediate approach. And this is a condition after 10 weeks, and we have actually checked the implants, and they have actually achieved uh, the osteointegration. So this is the soft tissue uh, condition. For the posterior, a lot of time we will propose using titanium abutments. Premolar, we use uh, zirconia abutments. And all these uh, finish nine are all designed one millimeter below uh, uh, gingival, and finally, these are cemented. I chose to do them as individual units because this patient preferred to be able to floss them like natural teeth. Later on, I will dis discuss also a little bit about single unit and multiple unit, and this is three months after the, um, the crowns are delivered. So this is a po portion of uh, treatment planning that may involve natural teeth and implants. Now, as we get to have scenarios like this, we always ask ourselves, how many teeth are we going to replace? A lot of time we replace up to the uh, first molar area. Then now the question is, based on this scenario, how many implants are we going to place and what are the positions going to place? As I talk a little bit about it, it's like your patient can have three implants and three unit crowns, or they can have two implants and a three unit bridge. In terms of cost to the patient, it makes a difference. So how are we going to discuss with the patient? So I learned a little bit out of this article when we talk a little bit about three-unit prosthesis in these particular scenarios. But assuming that you have two implants and the amount of load going to this implant is 100%, what we actually look at is if you have a cantilever design, the load or to this implant is drastically improved. Three implants in one nine, it reduces the force to these implants. Stagger this, 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 this design, you may have a further reduction in terms of force to these implants. And if you use wider implants, it also helps to drastically reduce. Don't pay too much attention on these percentages, but what we actually learn out of this is force distribu distribution theory for posterior teeth means that sometimes we may have to use more implants to spread the load. We want to avoid cantilever design, 
in uh, patients that have a lot of uh, uh, high stress, we use wider implants, and we believe in cross arch stabilization by moving the implants in uh, offline. So after your treatment plan, choose the number of implants and the position, you have to then design the final prosthesis. Traditionally, we use lost wax technique. Here is like we cast uh, in the, the, the goal abutment and took a lot of time. Today, we have CAT cam. We are going to simplify this procedure. You see, posteriorly in the past, we want to splint the PFM bridges together. This is how it looks like for a full mouth reconstruction. The uh, left side is a three-unit bridge. The right side is a three-unit uh, implant uh, uh, bridge. But if you look at it, actually, they look pretty much the same. So what I'm trying to stress at is the importance of the clinical diagnosis because the outcome is we want them, people to not know whether it's a bridge or it's an implant restoration. Here's a lower replacement. On this side, there's no bone grafting. We are able to place three implants and a three-unit uh, crown. Right side, we did some bone grafting, and we are able to create the same uh, uh, restorations. And this is how it looks like for a posterior replacement. So this took a lot of time from the technician because they have to wax up the, the abutments, they have to cut it, and they took too much time. Today, with CAT cam implant dentistry, we are able to have more precision. We are able to simplify the fabrication protocol. We are also going to reduce the number of human intervention, and this allows cost efficiency. Now, the requirements, definitely, as we design all these abutments, is we are able to get good materials, durable. We are able to design the finish line, create the emergence profile that we want for the best uh, of the results. Now, screw retain and cement retain restorations. Cement retain restorations requires the retention, cementation, as well as the nice abutments or uh, design. Now, in order for it to be successful, Laboratory consideration is how are we going to design the height of the abutments as well as the width of the abutments, the type of cement that we are going to use, and more importantly, the occlusal function for this patient. If patient is a bruxer and you do not have enough height, your crown will tend to dislodge easily. Now, how much height do we actually need? For natural teeth, we know it's about 3 to 3.5, but in this article in 2008, we noticed that which is done on implants, the abutments should not be less than 4 millimeters. So from that standpoint, we know that the minimum height. Now let's look at the finish margin. You have scallop finish margin, or you have a uniform finish margin. Which is better in terms of uh, clearing of cement? Definitely some finish line that is supra gingival or just 1 millimeters below gingival. Based on this article, 2011, he looked at different groups, 1 mm supra gingival, egg gingival, 1 mm, 2 mm, 3 mm sub gingival. At 2 to 3 mm, the residual cement is 10 times that at the 0 equal gingival or 1 mm below the gingival. So for that reason, we are now designing a lot of our apartments, supra gingival, equal gingival, or just maximum one millimeters below. Otherwise, you will see situations like this that will actually have an impact on soft tissue health. So if you see on your uh, right side, the finish line is all supra gingival for this posterior area and is facilitate cement removal. Now, material choice, we sometimes have to choose between zirconia and titanium and go. In recent times, we stopped using that because with CAT CAM, we are able to choose good materials in terms of titanium and zirconia. Now, I'm just going to use one case to illustrate some of the points on screw retain and cement retains that we have. All this posterior area, we actually have limited height. It was proposed by some oral surgeon to actually do a sinus graft, but the patient is uh, reluctant to do that. So in the end, we are using uh, shorter implants to avoid getting into this sinus. On the left side, we are going to use a three-unit bridge, cemented bridge. On the right side, because of the limited vertical height, we are going to use screw-retained restorations. 
So this is after um, impression. So we are going to connect the abutments that are designed using CAD CAM, which is very fast. So on the left, we are able to do two implants and three unit bridge. And on the right, patient's right, we notice that we have limited vertical space because in order for cement restorations to be successful, we need three to four millimeters of height, and then we need a minimum thickness of materials that goes on top of it, which is one to two millimeters. So if you do not have that minimum requirements in terms of uh, resistance and retention form, then our suggestion is to consider using a screw retained restorations. So in this particular case, we have uh, used two splintered implant crowns with a screw retained uh, design. In this particular case, we are not going to be concerned with the retention of the cement uh, issue. Now, we use a lot on screw retained restorations for limited height uh, space or bruxism, and also when we want retrievability. But the importance of CAD CAM technology today, impression has to be stressed. Impression becomes a critical area because the fabrication of your framework will be as accurate as your master model, not so much of the mouth. So we have to pay a lot of attention on the final uh, uh, impressioning. And I have to stress also that as we look at the design of prosthesis, screw retained prosthesis actually allow us better mesial distal flexibility, which means if you make a mistake in terms of position, you can use screw retain to correct them. See, this is a screw retain prosthesis, but you look at the final profile of this implant, it's very far coming uh, outwards uh, on the premolars. Why is that so? It's because they are trying to enclose the uh, excess hole. So in this particular case, how do we correct the uh, final crown form? We actually prep the, uh, the, the, crown, uh, the screw retained crown, convert it into an abutment, and took impression to do a final crown. See, cement restoration actually allow us to correct angulation problem. So screw retained allow us to correct positional problems. Cement restorations allow us to correct angulation problems. So when do we actually do splinted units and single units? Why do we actually splint? Because splinting allows us to use less implants, because we can actually have two implants and do a four-unit bridge for the anterior or do a three-unit bridge for the uh, posterior. Splinting concept is basically to allow us to reduce the amount of horizontal rotation that will happen at, at the abutment level. Now, let's look at splinting advantages. It allows better distribution, so which means that if you have limited number of implants, by splinting them together, we allow a good distribution of force. Easier, I put there, less interproximal contact. Because by splinting, your technician will do more work, but when you issue your splinted restoration, you are just dealing with one contact point, not multiple contact areas between two crowns and we can actually use less implants as a result of the advantage of splinting implants. Biologically, implant size, if they are very narrow, we actually splint them together. If the number is limited, we splint them together to take advantage of cross-arch stabilization. Implant position, implant stability, if they are on grafted bones, by splinting them together, we actually spread the load um, better. So what is the ideal ratio for posterior replacement? Ideally, we want one missing tooth using one implant for each missing tooth to be uh, in the anterior, something like, uh, something like before. And now, the amount of pontics, the number of pontics that we can allow is for posterior, one pontic, for anterior, two pontics. Because for the anterior, sometimes a bridge pontic side design actually can allow us better or uh, uh, outcome. Now, the disadvantage of splinting implants is the fabrication. We have to get very accurate impression. The technician have to design it such that you will have a close to passive fit. We also have to understand that there will be some form of jaw flexure. 
that is happening on the lower jaw and retrievability. Because splinting them together, it becomes harder to re retrieve. And of course, hygiene can be an issue because cleaning anything under the pontic can be a tough uh, situation. So let's look at this case as we actually try to restore the posterior segment. The canine is actually uh, uh, hopeless, it's failing. So in the end, we actually put three implants, a three-unit bridge from canine to the uh, uh, second premolar and a molar at the back. The importance of a restorative dentist sometimes is not so much about having the implants in the right position. I think we need to be able also to state, set the stage for the, for the technician to restore or make nice uh, prosthesis. So sometimes when we design pontics, when we design nice soft tissue architecture, we may have to use some form of screw retain provisional to create the soft tissue architecture. So in this particular case, we actually use screw retain restoration provisional, put it in the mouth so that over time, you actually create the nice implant site development as well as the pontex. Otherwise, you are just taking an impression of three implants and send it to the lab. You will never get a nice outcome. So in this particular case, we are able to use a screw retained provisional to actually create the implant as well as the pontic site. So from here, what we need to do is to take an accurate impression and transfer the implant location and the soft tissue architecture to them. And from the model, the technician will then do a full contour wax up. And from a full contour wax up, we can then design a cutback for the framework as well as the final uh, implant abutments design that is able to support this uh, framework. From there, they can then use a zirconia framework and some nice porcelain to actually layer so that we can have a nice anatomically uh, resemblance uh, bridge that looks good in the mouth. So from here, implant position, implants abutments, and finally, the uh, bridge. So thank you for the opportunity also for this. Today, we talk about posterior implants. The three things that I s uh, spent the past uh, 20 minutes talking is the size, the diameter, and the length, which is a critical discussion. Distribution, number, and position that has to be discussed prior to the surgery. And finally, design that will involve our technician. Should we be a screw retained, cement retained, splintered, or single unit? And the abutments design that is so critical in terms of long-term longevity. And definitely today, with so many different kind of materials that's available to us, that's something that we have to discuss with our patient as well. With that, thank you for your kind attention.